podcast, we talked about the forms of change as being planned, unplanned, and radical. However, to better understand the nature of change and resistance to change, we should begin by understanding the forces for change in organizational settings. We'll categorize these in two ways, those forces coming from outside the organization and those forces coming from within the organization. Now, while we won't list each and every possible force for change, we'll take a look at some of the major examples. First, one of the external forces for change in organizations is a changing workforce. Almost every organization has to adapt to multicultural environments, demographic changes, immigration, and outsourcing. As populations within a country change, and as organizations operate in new environments or serve increasingly diverse populations, the nature of who the workforce is and what their needs are will force changes within organizations. Second, changes in technology is an ongoing external force for change. Technology is continually changing the nature of work in organizations. For example, my husband is in IT, and the number of new tools that he has to learn on an annual basis just goes up and up. But for those of us in corporate communications, we are now expected to understand visual design, big data tools, and how to use different programs and tools to accomplish the work. We change platforms depending on what our organizations use. So advances in technology is continually changing all kinds of jobs and organizations. Economic shocks are one external force that I think we're probably all too familiar with from the economic crash of 2008, a decade of austerity, and now COVID. Economic shocks force changes in organizations. Fourth, competition in the nature of an organization's competition also forces changes. Today, competitors are just as likely to come outside our own countries as from across our towns. Also, changes like Brexit or new trade deals will force change as well. But what our competitors are often doing lead to changes in how we operate. Finally, society isn't static and organizations certainly cannot remain static. Organizations have to continually adjust product, marketing, communication, internal and external strategies in order to be sensitive to changing social trends. So questions about the impact of definitions of family, gender, support for different cultural needs for different employees and stakeholders mean that organizations often have to make adaptations in their employment, product and services that prompt serious changes within organizations. Now, when we look inside the organization, there are a number of internal pressures on change as well. One of the major ones is that over time, organizations can demonstrate declining effectiveness. The old ways just aren't working anymore, so there's pressure to change. So a company that experiences, say, a third quarterly loss within a fiscal year will be motivated. Some companies lay off, use cost-cutting programs, and others look at it as a problem to be solved and seek to understand the causes of the problem. In any case, it can prompt organizational change. Of course, one significant internal force for change is crisis. And yes, there are crises that emerge completely outside the organization's control. However, it's just as likely that the cause of a crisis will be something that happens within an organization. For example, labor conditions that lead to a strike or lax health and safety practices that cause accidents. When these kinds of crises happen, they will typically prompt change within organizations. A third very common internal force for change are changing employee expectations. As companies hire young newcomers, expectations for work in the organization can be very different. Today's workforce, for example, has higher levels of education, greater interest in career life balance, more likely to have dependent care, and are increasingly diverse. So organizations have to change to accommodate those interests and to attract the best new employees.
Fourth, the work climate can also prompt internal change. This is something we've been talking about across this lecture series, but in professional organizations, maintaining higher levels of employee satisfaction is absolutely in an organization's best interests. It's cheaper to retain employees than to go through the hiring process. But more than that, research shows that more satisfied employees are, the higher quality of work, and the more they produce. They're also less likely to go off sick as well. But one thing that a lot of organizations don't adequately consider is that satisfied employees are one of the principal sources of an organization's reputation. When organizations have reputations as good employers, it significantly influences outside stakeholders' interest in being their customers or just more generally in supporting the work that they do. So when an organization's climate is a problem, it can force organizations to make changes. We have spent a good chunk of time talking about what forces or enables organizations to change, and in the previous podcast we explored how resistance to change can affect the likelihood that change is going to be successful. But in this section we'll explore the reasons that people are often resistant to change. When we're implementing change, it's good to correctly diagnose what the real reasons are. However, as employees, when we experience changes, thinking about the reasons that we might be resistant and or might view change negatively is a practical way of assessing how we might be better employees as well. So one of the reasons that people resist change is all about self-interest. Ego often interferes with the ability to adapt to a particular change. Sometimes people want to maintain the status quo because it better suits their own personal agendas. You know, we may have things worked out pretty well for ourselves and in the end, when employees are acting in their own self-interest, instead of the organization's greater good, that resistance can lead to fairly unproductive exchanges and a, a digging in the heels to resist the changes that are implemented. Second, and I'd argue this is probably more common than self-interest, is something we've talked about before. Change typically brings uncertainty. Employees facing a technological change, for example, may resist the change simply because it brings ambiguity into what was once a comfortable situation for them. This is especially a problem when there's a lack of communication about the change. Addressing the fears of the unknown is exactly what good leaders, change agents, and good organizations do to support the change initiatives. Beyond the fear of the unknown, we can also fear whatever changes may take place, we may experience a loss that's something that matters. This goes beyond the ego-driven self-interest, but into things that affect us more psychologically. So when changes are impending, there can be lots of fear of loss, like job status, expertise, diminishing positive qualities in a job. For example, computerizing customer service positions at most telecoms companies have threatened the autonomy that representatives previously enjoyed, so that fear of loss is something that can really drive the resistance to the change. The fear of failure is probably a pretty common reason for resistance to change, but it's one that people don't often like to admit to, because some employees fear changes because they fear their own failure. For example, introducing computers into a workplace can arouse individual self-doubts about their ability to interact with the new system and new structure and, and frankly, the new tools that are being used. Resistance then stems from the fear that the change itself will not really take place. So for example, in one large library that was undergoing a major automation effort, employees had their doubts as to whether the vendor could really deliver the system promised. And so it, it prompted the fear that they wouldn't be able to do the work in the way that was being prescribed. A fairly practical reason we might find resistance to restructuring organizations, especially if people aren't being made redundant, is that employees may resist change that threatens to limit meaningful interpersonal relationships that they've developed on the job. Now, poor communication also begins to shift the onus of responsibility from employees experiencing change onto the place that I think it's often better placed, the organization and the people responsible for communicating the changes. Changes in an organization start with a decision maker. It's up to them to pass along the details to team members and ensure that all questions and complaints are handled before the changes go into effect. Unfortunately, as the news 
of a change spreads, sometimes the details are skewed and members end up receiving inaccurate secondhand information. So maintaining that effective good communication will improve the, the change process and also reduce resistance to change. Personality conflicts within organizations can also lead to resistance to change. This is especially true if leaders or change agents uh, create the problems themselves. So along the lines of poor communication, organizations can also choose their change agents poorly. When the change agent's personality engenders negative reactions, employees may resist change. Agents appearing insensitive may experience resistance because employees perceive their needs not being taken into account. Internal and external politics can also lead to resistance to change. And by the way, given the revelations about Joss Whedon, I appreciate that this quotation is ironic, but the reality is that internal and external politics represent a serious threat to change. Organizations and organizational change can shift the balance of power in the organization so people or groups who hold power in the current arrangement may be threatened with losing those political advantages in the face of change and so can resist it. Trust in the organization, of course, plays a big role in change resistance. When organizational members feel like they can't trust each other or key decision makers, it's harder to accept changes. They'll even ascribe changes to some negative underlying reason. Sometimes cultural assumptions and values can be impediments to change, especially if the assumptions underlie change that are alien to employees. This form of resistance may be difficult to overcome because some of the cultural assumptions are often unconscious. Some cultures, for example, tend to avoid uncertainty and change therefore may be met with great resistance. For example, if we look at Hofstadt's comparison of China, Germany and the UK on what he defined as the key factors describing national cultures. We can identify some of the opportunities and threats if we are introducing change when our employee base was made up of employees from one of these three countries. So first, for example, with power distance. Power distance represents the polarization of the superior subordinate relationship. So in Chinese versus German and British companies, it could mean that Chinese employees would be less likely to question their bosses and implementation of change coming from the decision makers when compared to Brits and Germans. Individualism contrasts between acting in the interest of the group versus the interest of the individual. So if we are introducing change to Chinese organizations, we might focus on the importance of the group stability, whereas to German and even more so to British organizations, we might emphasize the individual benefits of the changes being implemented. Third, with uncertainty avoidance, in the previous podcast we talked about uncertainty avoidance and also discussed it in terms of change agents being entrepreneurial. What this could suggest is that concern about uncertainties in change initiatives are probably going to be more problematic for German companies than for British and Chinese ones. Fourth, pragmatism. Uh, when we think about pragmatic cultures, people in those cultures tend to believe that truth depends on the situation, context, and time. So the case for change in Germany and China would probably be made based on focusing on benefits, on practical, implementable truths. However, in the UK, where there's a stronger belief in tradition, the case based on practicality might be harder to make. And finally, indulgence. This asks about the degree to which a society is restrained. That is the degree to which people try to control their desires and their impulses. So in a low indulgence society, that's one that doesn't put as much emphasis on leisure time and controls the gratification of desires. People with this orientation tend to have the perception that their actions are restrained by social norms and indulging themselves feels wrong. So, for example, in Chinese and German organizations compared to British ones, people might be less willing to voice their concerns about change and just carry on with it. However, in the British ones, you'd probably get a more genuine sense of the relative support for the change. <laughs>
Now, of course, these are all quite general statements, but it would give us a starting point for diagnosing and anticipating different change management and communication needs just based on broad sense of organizational and larger national culture. If we better understand the sources of resistance, from individual preferences to organizational communication problems, and even broad cultural expectations, the question is how do we deal with resistance? Traditional views on managing resistance used to think that it was somehow something to be overcome. Unfortunately, this often only serves to intensify it. We cannot simply bash through resistance and expect people to come on board. Instead, we should think about resistance as simply a form of feedback. If the feedback is used and responded to, it can help to productively manage the process. One key to managing resistance is to plan for it and to be ready with a variety of strategies for minimizing resistance and using resistance as feedback to help employees negotiate whatever change transition you're asking them to. One of the critical strategies for managing resistance is improving the quality of communication and information about the change. This can take on several different forms, including explaining the rationale for the change, providing accurate and timely information about it, having and inviting an open dialogue between decision makers, change agents, and members of the organization. It can also include implementing a process to educate employees about new work procedures, tools, and technologies to give them the confidence to implement them. Organizations should also think about managing fears through more two-way interactions and absolutely minimizing the rumor mill about the changes because that will run rampant and almost never in a good way. However, the challenge is that it can be expensive to implement and doesn't guarantee minimizing resistance, but better and more communication is very seldom going to result in damage. In addition to better communication, one of the most effective ways to reduce resistance to change is to encourage participation and involvement from employees across the units that would be affected, and importantly, employees who are at all levels of the organization. When the participation involves direct engagement and involves employees throughout the process, having a lot of people feeling involved certainly leads to better understanding, the opportunity to remove objectives, and basically increases the quality of the change-related decisions. But it's also a lot harder to resist a change that people have been meaningfully involved in making. A third strategy for managing resistance to change is through an act of facilitation and support process. This would be included at both the implementation as well as the refreezing stages of change management. Facilitation and support involves offering resources to help employees manage the change, identifying actual barriers like certifications, knowledge, physical and environmental factors, and so on, and then removing those barriers, and then also providing interpersonal and emotional support throughout the change process. A fourth strategy to manage resistance to change is ensuring strong change leadership. When we're talking about organizational leadership a couple of topics ago, we were talking about matching leaders for environments and situations. Change leadership's no different. These are the times when organizations need capable leaders to reinforce the climate and support for change. So this can include creating more prestige and credibility for people acting as change agents, and it can also involve exerting emotional or social pressure from leaders and generally using an active and positive leadership process to overcome resistance. So you'll notice none of these strategies so far are quick fixes. It's about engagement, good communication, and ongoing work. And that's the reality for good change management, and especially when we're thinking about the leadership side of the process. A fifth strategy for managing resistance is to negotiate with those who are resisting. Organizations can't please everyone all the time, but bringing together different groups to try and negotiate the details of the situation is commonly used as a way of managing the change process. This allows organizations to implement a direct cost-benefit analysis, evaluate what power is behind the resistance, and ultimately use negotiation to limit implementation resistance within the change. All of these strategies to this point can be successful and are generally recommended to be used to some degree to manage resistance to change because they're all really fairly pro-social and socially responsible. However, 
there are three more strategies that can be less so. When we look at some of the less pro-social strategies to manage resistance, we begin with manipulation and co-optation of concerns. Clearly, this is ethically dubious and can often backfire, but it is sometimes used when other methods haven't worked or aren't available because of time or circumstance. This involves manipulating the information available, resources, or using favors to try and overcome resistance. There are a lot of gray areas associated with manipulation, and the thing is that it often leaves a people with a really negative feeling about the situation. This is why it could be effective, but isn't recommended. The second of our more ethically dubious strategies to overcome resistance, and it is worse than manipulation, is coercion because it involves basically legal blackmail. It's often used when everything else has failed. So it could be like mutually assured destruction, like either accept the terms of the negotiation or everyone's fired. It wouldn't be in anyone's best interest to do so. But an inherent part of coercion is either an explicit or implicit threat and a message that those who stand in the way of the change will be removed. Obviously, this isn't particularly socially responsible and oftentimes is, is frankly, utterly unethical. The final one is more likely to be effective in more collectivist cultures or organizations with strong levels of identification among the employees with one another, like strong team environments. This focuses on using group dynamics to reduce individuals' resistance to change. For example, on a team, if one person messes up a drill, the whole team has to run a lap. Pretty soon, the person who messes up has so much pressure on them to conform that they do. This is called conservative control. And where instead of overt threats, it's a manipulation of a strong group dynamic to force people to comply. Certainly it can be ethical and it can be persuasive, but the overall ethics of it are dubious and the outcomes can lead to self-harm and even community violence. So it's a really dangerous dynamic to tap into. Now, setting aside some of the darker sides of managing resistance, what we have to think about in the general sense is that people are not the Borg that resistance is not futile and is often based in genuine concerns about the changes themselves. This is why it's more productive and effective for organizations to try and work with their employees and for also employees to want to try and engage with their organizations and take an active interest in change. So when we look across these strategies for managing resistance from the dubious ones that we ended up with to the more socially responsible ones that we talked about throughout, we can start to try and match them to situation, concern, and interest in terms of how do we implement effective change management.